Warning. Warning. Do not look behind you, because there's some new Eerie Cast and Darkness Prevails merch standing there. That's right, we've got a new merch store with some killer new designs such as shirts depicting your favorite Eerie Cast shows, unexplained encounters, freaky folklore, Redwood Bureau, you name it. Go to eeriecast.store and get some cool merch. Every sale supports our shows and helps to spread the word. That's eeriecast.store. Thank you. You're lying in bed, can't sleep, just looking at your phone. You absentmindedly glance at the nearby window in the dark. You didn't expect to see a figure there, and you've never seen a dog's head on a human body before. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me at Dark Prevails, where I tell people about our exciting upcoming novel release. Today I've got some very chilling stories about people who encounter the bizarre and creepy while being home alone. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org, and check out eeriecast.com to listen to our other shows and to shop our merch. Now, let's begin. My Childhood Experience from Mr. Encounter Stories. This took place in 2010 when I was 15 years old. I was living with my parents in a rural northeastern Ohio neighborhood. It was a pretty safe neighborhood. The houses were maybe a quarter of a mile apart and surrounded by woods in all directions. We had a dog named Spike as well as a few parakeets. Anyway, it all began on a warm early November day I even remember the temperature of that week being in the 60s, which is very uncommon in that area at the time. My parents had to go on a business trip, so I was left home alone. Now, this was shortly after daylight savings time had passed, so the sun set early in the western sky. I should also mention that my parents had bought me an old truck, which they used from time to time. I would spend countless hours working on it with my dad, even though I couldn't drive yet. I would often imagine myself driving this truck with my buddies one day. That vehicle is no longer around, it broke down a few years later. The weather that day was good, so I decided to go out and work on the truck after school. School ended around 2.45 for me, and I didn't get done with homework for another two hours after that, so I didn't get out there until somewhere around 5 o'clock, at which point the sun had already sunk beneath the tall trees. I'll mention here that our dog Spike was an indoor-outdoor dog and would often accompany me while I was working in the garage. Spike was a German Shepherd lab mix, so he was very protective of me. Around 5, I finally got out there with Spike and I started to tweak with things on the truck. Keep in mind, I left the garage door open a crack to let in the cool autumn air. I remember having to change the oil and while I was in the middle of doing that, I heard Spike starting to growl quietly at first. At the moment, I figured that maybe he was just grunting. I continued with my work, and I was almost finished when suddenly I heard this scraping and grunting sound. I looked over at Spike, but he had fallen asleep. As the sounds continued, he shot right up from his sleeping place and flew towards the garage door, barking madly, which was around the truck in front of me. I put down everything I was doing and rushed to the front with him. When I got there, I nearly jumped out of my own skin. There was this blackish gray wolf-like creature trying to crawl underneath the cracked door. It struggled because of how its body was angled. Its arms and legs bent at weird angles such that it struggled in a crawling position. At this point, Spike had his teeth bared and he had put himself between me and this ungodly beast. For a moment, this thing and I made eye contact, and it felt as if I was staring at it for hours, even though it must have been only a minute or less. The trance I was in was broken when I noticed the beast had made a lot of progress in getting under that door. When I saw this, I grabbed Spike. We flew into the house together, where I then shut and locked the door from the kitchen leading into the garage. I'll admit 
Spike was a heavy boy, but the adrenaline rush that I had outweighed any obstacle in escaping from what I'd witnessed. I wish that right now I could say that was probably the end of the experience, but unfortunately, that's not how this ends. Shortly after getting into the house and locking the door, I heard something heavy skitter across the garage cement floor and reach the door that I just went through. Spike was barking even more furiously now, and we soon began to hear scraping noises coming from the other side of the door. This scared me, and I immediately got away from that door. I began to check the other doors and windows into the house, making sure they were locked. After I'd checked the last window, I returned to the kitchen door, where Spike was still growling at the thing that was trying to break in. Spike and I then bolted to my parents' bedroom, where I knew my parents kept a loaded pistol. I then shut and locked the door. Spike wasn't barking anymore, but he was still growling menacingly. I don't know how, but I fell asleep clutching onto Spike. I was out for maybe only a few hours when I heard something coming from downstairs smash into what sounded like splintering wood. At this, my dog started barking and growling towards the locked door. At the same instant, I heard a large mass making its way upstairs fast. Spike had only let about five barks fly by the time it had made it to my door. To be honest, I thought I was going to die then, alone at my house, to this abomination. The creature slowly started working on trying to break down my parents' door. Thankfully, the doors to the bedrooms in that house were solid wood, so it would have taken a lot more effort than the one in the kitchen. I didn't panic this time. I wondered if I should call the police. I stuck my hand in my pocket, but my phone wasn't there. I left it in the garage. After that, I looked for a phone that my parents might have possibly left in their room, but no dice. I was one doorway away from this monster, who was apparently very intent on getting to me and doing who knows what. I sat there awake with a growling spike all night, listening to that thing scratch at the door. It felt like ages before I finally saw the first rays of dawn starting to appear in the early morning sky. Shortly after that, all the scratching ended. I peeked under the door crack, and I didn't see anyone or anything. I waited about an hour before I decided to risk it and run to my neighbor's house with Spike. Of course, when I got there, I didn't tell them about what happened, because at that moment, I was too scared to say much, other than I needed to use their phone. After talking to my parents, I went back to the house with Spike. I think that I'd made some excuse up like Spike had gone into this frenzy where he scratched and pounced on the doors and walls, as he was a pretty large dog. My parents believed me, and I didn't have to tell them the real story. After this incident, life moved on, and still to this day, I haven't seen anything else like it, nor have I heard of others having the same encounter. Home Alone from Motto Man I was what you call a latchkey kid, that means both my parents worked, so I took a bus to and from school. I used a key to get into my house when I was out of school, since no one was home. I'm an only child, so I spent a couple of hours each day all alone. When I was nine years old, my parents moved us into a new house in an upper middle class neighborhood, the type of neighborhood no one really expects to have anything bad happen. It was a suburb in Utah. Being home alone was uneventful for about eight years, other than the occasional salesperson knocking on the door, which scared the crap out of me since I was taught stranger danger. In 2012, when I was 17, my parents decided they wanted to spend a weekend in Wendover, Nevada. They enjoyed going and gambling, and it was only about one hour from where we lived. They left me home alone from a Friday night until Sunday morning. Now, a lot of 17-year-olds would have had friends over and dipped into their parents' alcohol supply. I wasn't the party type, but I did try to get my friends to come over anyway. 
but I guess they had something more fun to do, because I ended up just playing video games alone for the weekend. I was an athlete in high school, and I couldn't justify being a couch potato the whole time. So Friday evening, I decided to go for a short jog before I continued my video game binge. At about 8 p.m., the sun was going down. As I left my house, I noticed an old beat-up Honda Civic parked out front. The people inside were looking at me. I didn't recognize the three guys that were sitting in there, but I didn't think much of it. I ran around the neighborhood about one mile. I alternated between jogging and sprinting for every streetlight I passed. It was conditioning my wrestling coach had taught me. By the time I got home, just a few minutes later, the car was gone. I went back inside and grabbed some water, and I went to play more GTA 5. By about 1 a.m., I decided I would turn in for the night. My golden retriever and I curled up on my bed. I turned on True TV's Operation Repo, which was the only show that wasn't an infomercial that played at the time of night. After a few minutes, I heard four loud thuds. My dog was acting anxious, which wasn't out of the ordinary, but I was annoyed. I figured it may be my friends that had been ignoring me all weekend, slamming their car doors across the street. I went to look out my window, figuring I'd see them getting out of a car and joining the girls that lived across the street from me. But I didn't see them. What I did see was that Honda Civic again. I was a little unnerved, but decided to go back to my room. My dog was acting more intense than usual at this point. That's when I heard a few more loud thuds. My dog's hair stood on end, and she gave a low growl. I'd never seen her do that before. Even I was getting spooked then. I grew up shooting guns, and I knew where my dad kept them. I went and grabbed my dad's semi-auto 12-gauge shotgun. I wasn't sure what was going on. I decided I would sweep the house to see if it was a burglar. I didn't want to call the cops, just because I heard a noise. I went from the second floor all the way down into the basement, but I heard and saw no one. I then looked out the window, and that Honda Civic was gone. Tense, I went back to bed and eventually fell asleep. When my parents came back Sunday morning, they gave me some chores to do in the backyard. I was pulling weeds. My dad was sweeping the steps of our basement entry door, it's like a cellar door, when he called my name loudly, so I ran to find what he was yelling about. There were boot prints imprinted in the door. Someone had been trying to kick it in. He asked, You and your friends haven't been screwing around here, right? You haven't been kicking my door. My blood went cold, and I realized the noise I'd heard two nights ago was from that. Someone had tried to break in with me inside the house. I suspect it was the dudes in the Civic. What makes this scarier was that they knew I was inside as they watched me enter and leave when I went for a run. I'm scared to think of what their intentions would have been since they knew I was in there. But I am grateful my instincts to grab a gun were justifiable. All my dad said was, good thing we reinforced that door, huh? A few days later, I talked to my Boy Scout leader, who lived a couple of doors down. He had a daughter who was an only child like me. He let me know that while she was home alone that same week, she had called him freaking out. She said that someone had broken into their house so she locked herself in the bathroom with her dad's AR-15. She said she heard multiple men talking and ransacking the place. They tried to get into the bathroom, and that's when she dropped the bolt of the AR into battery, making a loud metallic sound unmistakably lethal, which scared the intruders away without anyone being hurt. I felt bad for her. She was a couple of years younger than me too, but I was very glad she had means to defend herself from likely the same people who tried to break into my house. Basement Dweller From Romeo Chick 
In a small town in Ohio, there is a very old house. A house I got the pleasure of moving into when I was 12. My father decided to buy the house out of the blue, and within a month, we were moved in and settled. The house was nice. To the right side of our kitchen, we had this basement. We built onto that house, adding an attached garage next to the dining room with a mudroom and laundry room. Now, my brother and I always had a lot in common. He was only four years younger than me. The biggest thing we had in common was how odd we were. Dad always said we were weird kids. Well, the three of us, my two brothers and I, were always home alone after school until the parents got off work. When I got off the bus, I went straight to my bedroom to do homework and watch House. I noticed while studying during that time, I would keep hearing this tapping sound. It drove me crazy. I would hear it almost every day. On this particular day, I just had to figure out what it was. We hadn't lived in the house very long at that point, but the strange things already started. I set my homework stuff down and listened for the sound. My brothers were already upstairs doing their own homework, although it sounded more like one of them was on their Xbox. I crept down the hallway, listening to the tap, tap, tap. My heart began beating harder as I followed these taps into the kitchen. My breath caught in my throat as I realized it was coming from our basement. My hand trembled as I reached for the basement doorknob. Don't! My little brother grabbed my hand to stop me. I jumped and looked over at him. What's wrong, Trav? I asked, feeling confused. He looked terrified and pale. It's down there, he said softly. My eyes widened. What? What is it? He went quiet and looked to the ground. Eventually, he shrugged and replied, I don't know. He was scared, I could tell. Normally, he wasn't like that. A few days passed by and the tapping was getting louder, or maybe I just focused on it more. It was a Saturday and my parents went out for a date night, so I was in charge of my brothers. They were upstairs playing games and I was in the kitchen making ramen. Then the tap, tap, tapping came again. I couldn't stand it. I put the hot water into the noodles and walked to the basement door. I hesitated as I reached for the door handle. My heart was in my throat as I turned the handle. The hair on my arms and the back of my neck stood on end. I opened the door while I held my breath. It was so dark inside, I couldn't see anything. I reached for the switch in the darkness. With a click, it slowly glowed to life. I peered through the dim light, searching for whatever that tapping was coming from. At first, I didn't see anything, but my stomach was in knots. Something was down here. I crept down the steps slowly, staring around the room. With every step, I thought my heart was going to force its way through my chest. The stairs creaked as I stepped off the last step and an icy blast shot through me. Then, the tapping stopped. I was left in a deafening silence in that dark room. Chills ran down my spine as I forced myself to swallow. Then I heard this gurgling sound right in my ear. It made me jump and I sped back up the stairs as fast as I could go. I swear I felt something watching me as I slammed the door shut behind me. I told you, whispered Trav. I couldn't breathe. Gasping, I said, what was that? He didn't answer again for a long while, but eventually said, it scares me at night. Trav was looking at the floor then. His words echoed in my ears. Have you seen it? I asked. He kept looking at his feet for a while until his head slowly tilted up to meet my gaze. He slowly nodded. Well, what does it look like? I asked, clasping his shoulder. He shook his head hard and his eyes welled up with tears. I hugged him. It's okay. We'll get it out of here somehow, I promise. 
I released him and took a step back. A few weeks go by, and we've ignored the thing lurking in the basement. The whole family was sitting at the dinner table eating dinner. It was a rare occasion when we were all together like this. I swallowed a bite of food and looked at my father. I remember him talking about work and how rough it was being in charge of a company. After he was done talking, I side-glanced over at Trav, who seemed to be staring at the basement door. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> so, uh, do you believe in ghosts? I asked out loud as if it were no big deal. Trav dropped his fork, looked at Dad, then back to me. A ghost? What has you on that? Dad chuckled. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot. They could be possible. If you have water and you have light, you have to have life. My stepmom huffed. What? None of those things are real. She laughed. Trav looked down at his food with a sad expression. Dad looked back at my stepmom and laughed. Of course you don't believe, he said. They argued playfully about this for another ten minutes. I knew that wouldn't have gone well, but at least I could blame it on my weirdness and move on. Later on that night, Trav knocked on my door. Yeah? I whispered. My parents were probably asleep, and I didn't want to wake them. My door opened, and Trav looked pale. It came upstairs, he whimpered, avoiding my eyes. My heart pounded then. What do you mean? How did it come upstairs? I sat softly on my bed and motioned him over. He ran over and sat on the bed with me, grabbing onto me tightly. I wrapped him in another hug and tried to comfort him. I pulled a golden cross necklace from my jewelry box and put it around his neck. Here, this will protect you. It used to belong to Grandma, I said. He looked at it and a smile appeared on his face. It will... His little voice shook. At that very moment, we heard a crash that seemed to erupt from the basement. We both jumped. It's back in the basement, he stated. He pulled a piece of paper from his pocket and unwrapped it, handing it to me. On the paper was a child's drawing of a monster. A very off-putting monster. It was tall, had a long tail, and it had no face but seemed to have three heads. It has three heads? I asked, startled by it. He shook his head and explained. No, he can bring up heads around him. He doesn't have one. I blinked a few times, trying my best to understand that. Trav stood up then and tried to reenact what he had seen. In the end, I think I understood. It was some sort of shape-shifting shadow that changed every time he saw it, but it always had a tail and what seemed to be horns. Its head was part of its body but would change every time he saw it. Around it, other heads would appear for some reason. Trav was very scared by this thing. I asked if it had eyes and he stammered. I usually no, but one time he did. I reassured him again that it would be okay. I let him sleep in my bedroom that night. The following day, I knew my parents would be working very late, so I talked to a friend at school about the ghost thing in my basement. He told me about how I could get rid of it if I had a Bible, holy water, salt, and iron. He then told me to watch this show that had just started recently. I did as he said, and he was right. The show was pretty accurate with the research I'd done, but not precise. I didn't have holy water, but I did have an iron wood poker from our fireplace, and I also had a Bible. I gathered all the candles in the house. I set them in a circle in the dining room by the basement door. I also had some Wiccan chants my friend had printed off for me, and the correct way to open the gates, as he put it. I read over the papers, while I anticipated in what order I had to light those candles. I grabbed a compass to see which way north was. I opened each tower the way I'd read it, lighting the appropriate candle as I did. I stood in the circle as I was instructed and started one of the chants. Not long into that chant, I saw my brother in the corner of my eye. He was crouched near the kitchen opening, 
hiding behind the counter that sat next to the fridge. Then, tap, 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 the tapping exploded right after my chant. I jumped, but made sure not to leave the circle. I realized at this point, I forgot to draw a circle at all around the candles using salt. My heart raced as a cold sweat leaked down my face. The basement door vibrated as the taps grew louder. The whole kitchen and dining room felt like it was shaking. I looked back at Trav, who was crying silently and holding a hand over his mouth. My own eyes started to water. I began shouting passages from the Bible, trying whatever I could to make it all stop. A deep growl sounded from the basement. Then this loud, high-pitched sound rang throughout the whole house. I jumped out of the circle then, grabbing my brother and running upstairs to my other brother's room. I slammed his door and panted hard. My other sibling, Cody, panicked as we barged in. After seeing our faces, he let it go. We went downstairs about an hour later unwillingly. I had to make sure the boys ate dinner and that the house wasn't burning down from the still-lit candles. As I reached the kitchen and could see into the dining room, my mouth dropped. The boys were right behind me, and I saw Trav's eyes grow wide from the corner of my eye. The candles were gone. I searched the entire house, and when I arrived back where they were supposed to be, the candles were back. I'm not sure what happened that day, but those tap, tap, taps never stopped. I'm so glad we don't live there anymore. Shadows in the City From Dark Raven NFFC I'm a teenage boy and I live in an urban area near London. The first encounter occurred on a mid-September Saturday afternoon at around 4.30 p.m. I was watching sports and slowly dozing off due to a long week at school full of exams. I was home alone at the time. My mom and dad were working 24-hour shifts, and my sister was at a friend's house. Everything was going just fine when the TV suddenly turned off. I reached to the other side of the sofa to grab the remote, but it wasn't where I'd left it. I shrugged it off as me being tired, and I found the remote on a table near the sofa. I kept watching TV for about another 15 minutes, when the TV turned off once again. I then felt an odd feeling of unease. I tried to shrug that off too. I went to grab the remote again, but once more, it wasn't where I put it. At this point, the feeling of unease was overwhelming and an instinct was telling me that I needed to run upstairs. I did, but the door of the TV room was locked. I was terrified. I felt I wasn't alone in that room. I tried to budge the door open, but as I did, I felt this cold hand grab me by my shoulders, sharp nails or claws piercing into my skin. Everything suddenly went black. I think I passed out. When I woke up, I was in my bed, the sun shining through my window. There were no marks on my body where I felt the hand or claws. It was morning, and I could hear my sister talking with my mother downstairs. I came to the conclusion that it was a dream. My mother must have brought me back upstairs to my bed, and that I was too tired to remember that. I soon forgot the encounter. This second event happened after a long school day. I was coming back from football practice around 6 p.m. I was waiting for the bus with my friend at the bus stop when that feeling of unease came back. It wasn't as intense, but I still recognized it. I got on the bus and listened to some music until I got home. When I arrived home, I felt tired and exhausted, so I went to bed but at around 3 a.m. I woke up to the odd feeling of someone being in my room with me. I tried to fall back to sleep, but I felt paralyzed. I couldn't move a bit. I tried to scream, but no sound left me. The feeling of uneasiness was worse than ever, and I felt the same freezing cold hand grab my left ankle. 
Again, I felt as if I was going to black out. I suddenly heard the sound of my mother going to get a glass of water. I was finally able to let out a sound, which alerted my mother, even though it was quite faint. She rushed upstairs, and the feeling slowly faded away. If my mom wasn't downstairs at the time, if she hadn't managed to hear me, I don't know what would have happened that night. I haven't had an encounter since, and I hope that was the end of it. Something has been following me. From Lotus Tears. I'm a normal teenage guy. I go out with friends, fight with my parents sometimes, and I work at a bird hospital. But I think something spiritual has been following me. This started years back, so I'm going to tell the story in the order of events I remember. The first encounter was when I was in the kitchen with my mom, brothers, and grandma. We were sitting down for lunch, just chatting. I don't remember what about. Our talking was soon silenced by the sound of footsteps in the landing room. For context, our house is a plantation house in Hawaii. Inside, there are stairs from the front door into the landing room. Then it splits off so we could go into the bathroom, my parents' room, kitchen, or living room. Anyway, we all heard the footsteps. They were these heavy thuds. My mom and I got up and searched the house, calling out but finding nothing. I was paranoid for a while after that. I don't remember if I ever told anyone that story outside my family, but everyone heard the footsteps, so I wouldn't be too crazy sounding, hopefully. Now, the second event was at least a month later. My mom and I were sitting in the kitchen again. I think we were cooking. My brothers were out of town with my dad. My mom and I were talking about something I don't remember what. If this adds anything to the story, I have memory loss, so that's why my stories might lack some details. Anyway, suddenly we heard someone call my mom. I swear it sounded like one of my brothers. The two of us freeze. My mom calls back to the voice, and I go outside to check. Now, we have neighbors, but it's one dude, so it couldn't have been him. Also, I know he had been out for the day working in his wood shop, and my other neighbors were working. We ended up just brushing it off because maybe we'd just been hearing things. At least a month after that, I was home alone using the bathroom when I heard someone knock on the bathroom door. To say the least, I stayed in that bathroom until my parents got back. I didn't have any more experiences for a while. About a year later, it seemed to just happen again. I had been chatting with a close friend of mine. We were talking about scary things, and I ended up mentioning what had happened in that past year. I think talking about it again made whatever it was angry, and it awoke to torment me. I was home alone sitting on the couch texting some friends when I heard footsteps. I was quickly freaked out, because these footsteps were quite loud, as if they wanted to be heard. I immediately thought back to what had happened that year ago. I rushed outside and hung out with my cats for a while. Eventually, I got the courage to go back inside. I sat down, only to hear those footsteps again. It sounded as though they were everywhere, and before long, I heard low talking sounds in the kitchen, like people were having a hushed, personal conversation in there. I once again left for outside this time calling my friend who lives up the road to come down and hang out with me. When they got here, my friend ended up sitting inside with me. We didn't hear the footsteps or talking then. It made me feel stupid. She ended up going home before my folks got back, and in horror movie fashion, my parents didn't believe my story. About a week after that, I was home with just my two brothers. We were getting ready for school as my parents had gone out early. The school I'd been going to at the time was just down the road, and someone would be driving my littlest brother to the elementary school. Now, my youngest brother can be a bit of a brat. He actually ran and locked himself in my parents' room when I tried to tell him to put his shoes on. I've never felt such rage before. Maybe it was my teenage anger or something, but I had no control over it 
It was almost like having an out-of-body experience as I watched myself turn around and ram into my parents' door. When I finally calmed down, I learned I'd broken my parents' door and I would later be punished accordingly. But at the moment, I turned to go outside and grab the key to my parents' door. I still don't know why I did that. It's still a mystery to me. Now, since then, I've been hearing footsteps, but nothing too interesting, as after a while, you do get used to it. One night, though, I was trying to get some sleep. I was home alone again, just staring off into space, probably thinking about what I'd do the next day or something like that. Out of nowhere, I began feeling like this touch on my thigh and knee. It felt like a hand rubbing my thigh, then going down to my knee. It was numbing, kind of a sparking feeling if that makes sense. It reminded me of when your leg falls asleep, but a tad different. After about a minute of this, the feeling stopped. Then it happened again a week later. I didn't feel scared or anything, but it was definitely strange. I've gotten the same feeling a couple of other times when washing dishes. I feel someone touching my shoulders and arms. Another time I was trying to sleep when I heard the footsteps again. I ignored them as always, but then I saw this figure. I was so startled, I grabbed my pocket knife from the desk and held it close in case it was an intruder. But as I watched it, I noticed it was a woman, and she seemed angry. When she saw me awake, she stumbled towards me and shook me. I tried to push her away. She was an elderly Hawaiian woman. She had cracked brown skin and very sad eyes, even though she appeared quite angry. Again, my house is a plantation house. It does have a history. A long time ago, Hawaiian families were kept here and forced to work. My house is also very close to the old railroad, ditches, and old sugarcane fields. Back then, Hawaiians were even kidnapped and forced into Christianity. So I think maybe she was an angry spirit from back then. And honestly, I feel nothing but sorrow for her. My house is very close to an old girls' school, where they would keep the kidnapped girls and make them into suitable housewives. It's a known fact at the school the girls were abused and torn away from their families. The school has a very haunted feeling in it, and when I'm there for hula, I often hear voices, sobbing, and I see people. This last story is different. One day at school, I was walking to a class late, so I took a shortcut. My school is spaced out and it has patches of woods and farmland. So I walked through a wooded area, trying to get to math class. As I did, I heard someone talking behind me. It sounded like this guy I kind of had a crush on, and it sounded like he was talking to me. The conversation went like this. Hey, hey L. L. He called to me. When he spoke up, his voice wobbled and broke. I could hear patches of darkness in his voice. I have this tendency not to turn around when I hear people talk to me. I'm not sure why, but it's just a habit. Hey, uh, hey S, S, what's up? What's up? I called back. I was in a bit of a rush because my last class had been English, which was near the PE field, and math class was on the other side of the campus. Nothing much, Nothing just, much going just going to math, math class, S replied. It sounded like there was a veil over his voice. He sounded strained, like he was holding back. Oh, did you get mixed up? You don't have math with me, I said back with a laugh. I made it to the end of the wooded patch by the end of this conversation. That's when I felt him grip my shoulder, and I finally turned around to look at him. S looked, for the most part, normal. But because I had a bit of a crush on him, I noticed differences in his appearance that weren't there the day before. His hair seemed to be a different color. His eyes were shifty and a different color too. I stepped away from him, and for the first time in the conversation, he let me hear his real voice. Silly me. Bye, Al. See you later. His voice was deep and animal-like then. I quickly backed away from him as the bell for class rang. I paid no mind to it 
as I watched S back away into the woods. His body seemed to stretch and grow as he backed into the shadows. I was horrified. I don't plan to take that shortcut again. My math teacher let me off with a warning for being late. I've talked to S since that conversation, with whatever that was, and I didn't tell him about it because I don't want to sound crazy. A couple of days ago, I was at the homecoming dance with S. We were off chatting near the entrance to that patch of woods. S was turned away from the woods as I was facing them. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the other S. I don't even know what to call it. It waved at me, before slinking back into the shadows. I suddenly felt cool fingers running up my spine as my breath hitched in my throat. It was then that the real S noticed me nervous and suggested we go off to the cupcake stand. We ended up staying there until my parents came to get me. I've yet to tell anyone about all of this, and I don't know if I plan on telling anyone, because I might just sound crazy. I do struggle with anxiety and other things that I'm getting tested for, but I don't think that's what this is. I think it's something more. Reserve Skinwalker From Anonymous I got this story from my friend who lives on a reserve. For privacy reasons, I'll refer to him as Z. Z lives on this reserve in the British Columbia interior. There, he has experienced many creepy things, but one stands out to him the most. One night, he was home alone with his siblings. There is a big window in his living room overlooking the reserve that always gave him creepy vibes at night. That night, while he was playing his PS4, the curtains on the window were open. He claims to have had bad experiences with windows like this. Even on one occasion, his grandparents warned him about looking out that particular window. In the middle of the night, he looked out that window, and he saw a pair of hands on them. So, that night, to avoid any frights, Z decided that he was going to pause his game and go and close those curtains. As he did so, he suddenly felt like he was being watched by something. It was like he was put in a trance. He just stood there, unable to look away from his yard, which bordered a lake. He then looked up at the school in the distance, where streetlights were bright. That's when he saw a silhouette pacing around his yard, almost out of nowhere. Then, in a hurry, able to move again, he closed the curtains and rushed to the basement where his room was. He closes the curtains in his room, then remembers his siblings. His little brother was in his own room, playing video games with the curtains open, but his door was shut tight, so Z didn't go into his room. However, his sister was sleeping, so quietly he closed her curtains in her room. Back in Z's room, he sat there in his bed, just going over what this pacing silhouette could have been. He narrowed it down to just a bear, or maybe even a drunk man. But then, he heard someone knocking on the window upstairs, the big one that he was scared of. He thought, that's impossible. The window was up like eight feet off the ground, he then realized that his room was right below that window, and whatever was knocking was just past the curtains of the downstairs window. He pulled the covers over his head and tried to ignore it was happening. Then he heard a loud thunk, as if someone had took a step back, a heavy step. He heard something or someone pacing all the way around the house until they stopped at his brother's room. Then he heard the loudest scream. Z rushed into his little brother's room to see his sibling under his covers, crying hysterically. He looked up at the window and saw something he would never forget. It was a figure crouching down. This thing was impossibly skinny, and its skin was gray. There was nothing there to indicate gender, but its face is what made him the most terrified. It had these jet black eyes and narrow red pupils, and its mouth seemed to open at its neck, 
Instead of a nose, it was just a small slit. Against every instinct he had, he walked to the window with his eyes closed and blocked it with the curtains. That night, they stayed in the sister's room. Their parents had come back that night. Z woke up to his mom shaking him awake. There was a bag in her hand. He was escorted to the truck by his mom and stepdad, where his brother and sister were. Together, the family sped out of the res without a word. Z's parents never said a word about why they left in such a hurry. Z ended up never going back to that house. But his parents did go back two days later to grab everything. Z is currently staying with his grandparents in Vancouver. He knows why his parents wanted to get out of that place. And he said he will be forever scared of big windows and of the dark. Spirit in the Basement From Anonymous The story I'm telling you comes from my uncle. I heard this story many times growing up, and looking back as an adult, I assumed this story was fictional, as he was the type of uncle to play pranks and tease his nephews. We recently got together after many years apart. He came to visit mine and my fiancé's first house. We spent that evening showing him around the place, cooking dinner, and ending the night with a few drinks in the living room. It was great to see him after so long to catch up. After a few hours of talking about our wedding in the house, our conversation switched to the paranormal. He asked if we had any odd experiences in the past four months since moving into the new house. Luckily, I told him we haven't. This question about my new house and the ghosts that might inhabit it sparked my memory to his ghost story that I'd heard long ago. I brought it up and I asked him if it really happened or if he was just teasing my cousins and I. Then his demeanor changed. He paused and looked down at his drink before finishing it. I could tell this was a story he had not thought about in many years, but the thought of it brought back all the terror he experienced long ago. He said to me, Get me a bourbon and you'll have your answer. I wasn't expecting the lighthearted mood of the night to change so quickly, Nonetheless, I grabbed two whiskey glasses and poured out our drinks. The mood was set for the story as the sun had all but disappeared behind the trees in our backyard. Night quickly approached us. Just like you right now, nothing happened the first few months after I purchased that townhouse. I moved in January of 2001, and everything was perfectly normal. On a Friday, during the first summer in the house, I left for work in the morning, and I got back home around 5 p.m. When I got home, I went down to the basement to bring a can of food to the cat. She liked to stay in the basement most of the time. The basement was furnished, so she had plenty of room to spread out. When I got down into the basement, I noticed the light was on. I thought to myself, that's odd. Maybe I forgot to shut it off before going to work that morning. I thought little of it and switched it off. I went back upstairs and made myself some dinner. After dinner, I once again went to the basement to check on my cat, and again the light was on. This time I was certain I shut it off. I was creeped out too, but I chalked it up to a long work week, and I must have hit the secondary switch at the top of the stairs, and that's how the light was still on. I made a conscious note in my head and said that both switches were flipped down, the next time I went down there, the light should be off. So I went back upstairs to unwind for the night. I sat down and put on a movie. A few hours went by. Before long, it was midnight. I had forgotten about the strange situation from earlier until the movie ended. That's when I had to go back to the basement once again to check on the cat. I walked on down the first flight of stairs and got to the landing. My worst fears were realized when I turned the corner and I saw the light coming up from the basement. I was home alone. This couldn't be happening. I had to check and make sure an intruder wasn't in my house. I searched in the various rooms of the basement, and I truly was alone. 
That's when the most intense feeling of dread overcame me. This house was haunted, I thought to myself. I quickly made my way to the stairs, and as I did, all the lights went out. I screamed and ran as fast as I could up the stairs. I slammed the door behind me and ran out of the house. I took a few moments to catch my breath. I sat in my car in the driveway for a while. I was just sitting there, staring back at the house, wondering what I should even do. I said to myself, I have to stand my ground. It's my house. So I went back inside. I made my way to my bedroom, and I lay awake for hours. Every creak and crack jolted me upright. Eventually, I fell asleep. But after that night, I never fell asleep easy in that house. I sat there taking the story in. It was how I remembered it, but now knowing it truly did happen, it kinda shook me. We both looked at each other, not saying much. We finished our whiskey and he said, I hope nothing like that happens here in your house, but you always have to be on your guard. I don't think it was an evil presence, just a spirit, letting you know that they lived here too. We called it a night after that, and I lay in bed thinking about the story. I'm just hoping after four months living here, there's not a spirit waiting to announce they live here too. It came in and left through the fireplace. From Anonymous. The first house my husband and I lived in was an absolute terror to me. The first day of ever seeing the house I felt an eerie feeling about the fireplace in the living room. My husband, Tim, told me he thought I was imagining there was something eerie about it. We decided we wanted the house, and we moved in a couple of weeks later. But two days after moving in, we both came down with flu-like symptoms. The illness was bad enough to keep us in bed for a week. Tim recovered, and he returned back to work, but I would remain sick for three months I saw two doctors and neither of them could tell me what was wrong. I got better after three months, finally, but I still had an eerie feeling about that fireplace. I would pass by the living room and just stare at it. A few weeks later, while I was at home alone, I heard the water running in the kitchen. I hadn't been in the kitchen to turn the water on, though. I thought someone must be in the house, so I called for Tim, but he didn't appear to be home. I couldn't find anyone else in the house, so I called Tim, but he said he was at work. He didn't take this very seriously. I knew I hadn't turned the water on in the kitchen sink. That same day, I started to have feelings that I was being watched. It was this feeling of dread. It was so strong, I just broke down into tears. I couldn't see anyone, but I felt a strong presence. Our TV would also turn on and off on its own. Tim and I would both begin getting strange texts on our phone. Tim even had a text that appeared to be from me, but I'd never sent that. It was the word why, typed out 25 times. We began to hear noises in the house at night and during the day. We have three cats, and they were all terrified of something. They would scratch on the door to come into the bathroom with me when I was in the shower. I would let them in and they would try to find a place to hide. One night at around 1am, we were awakened by a big boom and the house shook. A tree from the road behind our house looked as though it hopped over the fence and fell on top of our house. The fence was not touched and there was no damage to the house, thankfully. The tree cutters thought it was really strange. I was horrified and I didn't like being in that house alone anymore. My cats started to stare at the fireplace on a daily basis. I told Tim I felt that whatever it is travels in and out through our fireplace. The cats were just always staring at it. We did use the fireplace during the winter, and it would be fine while lit. But when it wasn't lit, that feeling of dread came back over me. Sometimes I would hear papers rattling around in Tim's office that was down the hallway in the last room. My cats would hear it too and stare in that direction with their pupils and eyes so huge. 
they would often go hide after that. Tim decided we needed to get away for a weekend. We went to the beach, which was a three-hour drive. A close friend said she would come by and feed our cats twice a day. The night before we were supposed to go back home, Sarah called me. She was the friend that was over feeding our cats. She said she just can't go back to our house to feed the cats again. She asked if we could just leave a little earlier to be able to make it home by late morning. I said yeah, and asked her if anything was wrong. Sarah said that she had sat down in the living room and was watching TV. She was waiting for the cats to finish eating. All of a sudden, this intense feeling of dread came over her, and she felt she was being watched. So she turned the TV off and left. She called me on her way home. I told Tim we needed to leave early the next morning, and we did. I continued to experience the same issues every day. Sarah told me to contact this woman, so I did. The woman told me to buy some sage and burn it throughout the house, and to tell this entity to leave. I did as she said, burning the sage in every room and closet in the house, telling whatever it was to be gone. But this didn't work. I contacted the woman again. She told us to try sweetgrass. She says if this didn't work, she knew someone of Native American heritage who could try talking the entity out of the house. The woman also said the entity could be coming and going through the fireplace, and I told her that I was positive that was the case. I could feel it strongly. I did as she said again, burning sweet grass throughout the house, telling the entity once again to leave. We didn't have any more problems after that, thank goodness. Tim works a lot and was not at home as much to deal with what I did but we lived in peace for a year in the house. Even so, it never did feel like home to me, because I never felt safe in it. We put the house up for sale and we sold it quickly. I was so happy to be away from it. Now we have a new house, and both of us feel at peace there, and we both feel like it's actually our home. Now, I didn't believe in spirits or ghosts before all of this. I doubted people who encountered such things. I sincerely apologize for feeling that way to anyone who has had to deal with what we did for over a year. This was tormenting. It was terrifying. I didn't tell about all the events that took place, but I told about most of it. I'll never again doubt anyone who says they encountered something like that in their home. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.